Hello. In this video, we're going to talk about another type of holding circuit, which is the sample and hold circuit, uh, also sometimes referred to as a track and hold circuit. And uh, the operation of the circuit is simple. It basically samples an analog input signal at the specific points in time, and then it holds uh, that sampled value of the analog input signal until the next sampling event. Uh, they're typically used, or one of the most common uses of these circuits, as you can imagine, is going to be in as the input stage of an analog to digital converter. I have uh, drawn here a, a simplified version of a sample and hold circuit, just to illustrate its operation. Uh, notice that we have an input signal, uh, voltage V in, which is being fed through a, a MOSFET transistor, which is operating as a switch to a capacitor, and then the capacitor is connected to an output buffer. The idea is that there is a clock that is driving the gate of that, uh, of that uh, MOSFET transistor, of that switch, and basically turning the switch on and off, or putting the transistor into either conductive mode or non-conductive mode. <clears throat> uh, when the clock goes high, then the transistor is conducting, and so there is a path from V in to C, capacitor C, and so the capacitor will charge to the voltage value of V in. That will be the sampling operation. And then as the clock signal goes down, the transistor will go in cutoff, switch will be open. And uh, since the capacitor is connected to a high impedance uh, terminal, hopefully it will be able to hold its value. There, there will not be substantial discharge. This will be the hold uh, part of the cycle until the next uh, sampling event, which will happen when the clock goes high again. And then the capacitor will sample the input signal again uh, by either charging or discharging to the new value of the input signal. And then it will hold it again and so forth. If we uh, look at the result over time, we can represent the input signal as a continuous signal over time. And basically the output signal, what we are doing is we are at the sampling instance, we are sampling the input signal value, we're holding it, then we're sampling it again capacitor charges to the new value, holds it, samples it again, and so forth. It goes charging or discharging to the particular values and then holding that value. And so what we end up with at the output is a, a staircase a version of the input signal. Um, there are multiple possible implementations for uh, such a circuit, but uh, one of the common ones will be the one that I have drawn here, which consists of an input buffer. And the switch, uh, which in this case I've just represented as a switch, but it could be a MOSFET transistor, for example. Uh, there is a, a clock signal that allows the switch to open and close. And then uh, there is a capacitor, which is our storage element, the, the holding element, and it's connected to an output buffer. Um, and one of those terminals is supposed to be a positive input terminal for the open. So, uh, Let's imagine that our input signal uh, reaches a certain value. Uh, the clock signal, which controls that switch, I'm going to just put a little clock next to it so that we realize a bit. And then the clock signal goes high, the switch closes. Um, v in basically is transferred through the op amp, through the input buffer. And so um, capacitor C is charging uh, through the output of that first op amp to the input value V in. And then the switch opens, and uh, that capacitor, since it's only connected to a high impedance terminal, the input terminal of the op amp, holds its value, and then V in keeps changing. Imagine that V in uh, takes on a new value, the switch closes again, the capacitor will either charge or discharge to the new, new value of V in uh, because of the feedback configuration, a negative feedback configuration of the output buffer, uh, both. Uh, input terminals will be sitting at that new value of V in and so forth. Uh, so basically the, the output signal uh, V out, which is connected to the negative input terminal, will take on whatever value uh, the capacitor has, which is the previous value of V in. So essentially what happens is uh, switch closes, V in gets transferred from the output of the first buffer to the capacitor, and then this is sitting at V in because of the negative feedback effect, the output of the op-amp is going to be such that this node also sits at V in, 
which means V out is equal to the previously sampled V in. When the switch opens, um, as V in goes changing, the voltage across the capacitor remains stable. Uh, when the switch closes again, the voltage across the capacitor becomes the new value of V in and so forth. And so that's the output of the circuit. Um, there are uh, also a couple of diodes here, which we haven't explained yet, uh, their function. And the, the reason for those diodes is they're preventing saturation of the first op amp. So those two parallel diodes, we should make a note here. D1 and D2 prevent op amp saturation. And the way they do that is um, by clamping uh, or, or clipping the value of the output of the first op amp, which I can refer to maybe as V out prime, um, at the particular voltage level, which is going to be uh, within one diode drop of V in. So notice that. Uh, this terminal, the negative input terminal of the first op amp is connected to V out. So that's sampling V out. Um, and therefore, when uh, V in increases with respect to the previous value of V out, let's imagine for V in greater than V out, then V out prime is going to want to turn towards a positive value. And uh, D2 is going to make sure the two is going to turn on and make sure that V out prime stays uh, one diode drop higher than uh, the, the previous value of V in. And so for V in greater than V out, we can say uh, V out prime is going to be equal to V in plus 0.7 volts, meaning diode D2 is on, diode D1 is off. And in the opposite case, for V in less than V out, Again, V out prime is going to want to go towards a negative value, but diode D1 is going to clamp it at uh, 0.7 volts below the value of the input signal. So V in minus 0.7 volts since D1 is on. Uh, the reason why we want to prevent saturation of the op amp of the input buffer is because in a sample and hole circuit, the frequency of operation of the circuit is going to become important. Um, and remember, going um, out of saturation is a slow process for an op amp. So if we have a saturating configuration, then it's going to mean a reduction in our maximum frequency of operation. Now, um, ideally in a sample and hole circuit, we would like to have uh, fast sampling frequencies or be able to sample fast, but um, the sampling frequency is also going to be limited by the fact that the capacitor C needs to have enough time to charge or discharge to the next value of the input signal. And so one important consideration is that the, the sampling rate or the sampling C frequency, I'm going to call it F sampling, uh, must be slow enough to allow C to charge or discharge to the next value of V in. Um, and the, the time that it takes for that capacitor to charge or discharge in a sample and hold circuit, it's referred to as the acquisition time. And uh, it's going to be limited by, notice that the, the way that the capacitor ch charges and discharges is through the first op amp, the input buffer op amp. And so uh, how fast it does it is going to be limited by the amount of current that that first op amp can provide. And so we have that the amount of um, the current through a capacitor is going to uh, relate to the rate of change of voltage across the capacitor via the capacitor equation I equals C dV dt and therefore my dV dt maximum for the capacitor is going to be equal to um, I divided by, by the capacitance and this I is the, I'm going to call it I max, is the maximum output current provided by uh, the op amp in the input buffer. And so that's going to be a parameter that affects um, how fast we can sample our signal as well. Um, 
there is there are other sources of error, there are multiple of them, but uh, one common one that we typically encounter is that uh, the capacitor there is a, an error between the ideal voltage that the capacitor is charging to, or the ideal output voltage of the sample and hold circuit, uh, which is equal to V in. In reality, it's never going to be exactly equal to V in. There are some errors there. Uh, one of the errors is known as the, the hold step. And the hold step comes from the fact that uh, there is some charge injection uh, from the MOSFET switch closing and therefore there's going to be a, a differential between the um, the input signal and the, the voltage across the capacitor and that's going to be due to that additional charge being injected. Uh, and then another source of error in that uh, voltage signal is going to come from the slow discharge of the capacitor during the whole time and that's uh, typically referred to as the droop of the capacitor or the voltage droop. And so initially the capacitor is going to start uh, due to the hold step at a value which is slowly higher typically than the input signal and then it's going to go drooping as opposed to holding the signal constant. Uh, but anyway, I think that those are more or less the, the basics uh, for the circuit. Again, it's a similar type of circuit to the, um, the envelope detectors or the peak detectors that we have previously seen because the operation is so similar. Uh, but with the addition of the, the sampling operation, which is implemented typically via switch. Thank you.